Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast, which is called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, the past, the present, sometimes even the future, their history, their music, whatever we feel like talking about. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the three regular co-hosts of this show, also known for my syndicated Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing, and for my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, being joined by... My two other regulars, the leading man for bringing you Beatle news on the internet, and he also writes for many publications, including Billboard and Variety and Access.com. That's AXS.com. And that's our own Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also we have a man who has worked for the New York Times in their classical department and also for many years writing for Beatle Fan Magazine and the author of the Beatle book, The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, as well as Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, we've got a special guest. She was here with us in the past. And we're happy to have her back, Jude Kessler, who has written a series of books, narrative books, on the life of John Lennon. And she just completed her fourth in the series, which happens to be called Should Have Known Better. We welcome back Jude Kessler. Hi, Jude. Hi, Ken. Hi, Alan. Hi, Steve. Thank you guys so much for having me back again. Great to have you back. You know, you're welcome anytime here. Thank you. We're going to be starting our show as we normally do with the latest in Beatle news. And since we didn't have a show last week, we have a little bit of catching up to do. And certainly where Paul McCartney is concerned, he gave us three secret gigs. Actually, you could say three concerts plus a Q&A for Facebook. And it all started with a concert that he gave at Abbey Road Studios. You want to talk about that, Steve? The Abbey Road Studios thing was was a secret gig, um, and people were a few people were invited, and he walked to the studio. That that was the big thing. He walked to the studio and crossed the crossed the famous crossing, and it was on the the webcam. And people uh, uh, apparently, from what I'm told, or from what I've, what was posted, not too many people actually recognized him when it happened, which it, that's kind of hard to believe, but apparently from the pictures, it went pretty uneventful and he walked in and the, they gave the show inside the, uh, the studio and it was a relatively short set and he did some new songs. And, um, so there, and, and that was that. So was that um, why he walked across would... twice? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, because yeah. No one recognized them the first time. Right. Why did why did the, why did the Beatle cross the road? <laughs> I don't know if I'd call it a short set. I mean, he normally gives you thirty five songs in a normal concert of his, and he gave twenty three wow. at this show. So I think the fans who were there, the uh, the very special ones that that won tickets to get in, they were given some treat, and to do it at Studio Two, yeah, of all places. I mean, and it's it was, one thing, <laughs> you know, right. imagine, imagine to see a show with Paul in a small club. And a few of us have been fortunate to be able to say that. But at Abbey Road, <laughs> right. in the and, very and, same room where most of the magic was made. So, And, and this was done for Spotify. So Spotify is going to have it. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of wondering with all three of these performances, if any of them are going to be released commercially. Well, I, I, not to get ahead of it, but I think one of them will be. Mm. So, well, we we're not sure which one that will be, but well, actually, actually, I think there's a good there's a good clue. Let's talk about the others first, and then we can we can get to that. Two days was it? Two days later, uh, a couple of day, uh, a day or so later, they did the the show at the Cavern. And the tickets were handed out at Echo Arena. People were waiting in line apparently at the Cavern from somebody I talked to that was there and uh, they announced uh, or Paul announced around nine o'clock in the morning on the web that it was going to, the tickets were going to be available at Echo Arena and people, some people rushed from the cavern to Echo Arena and unfortunately didn't get tickets, but some people were already there in line and and got tickets. There were only, according to what I was told, 110 public tickets available. 
So, and he, again, he didn't do as long a show as he would normally do, about the same number. I can't, I didn't, I don't have the set list in front of me, so I don't have it counted, but um, he did four new songs um, there. One of which, by the way, is called Fu You, F U H Y O U. And um, we have no explanation as to what that means. Apparently, he, he did say something, at, and, and I had different stories about what it, what it means, but uh, I, I, I don't know yet. So he did Confidant, he did that one. I, I, I'm fortunate I don't have, He did uh, Come On to Me. Come On to Me, and he and, did a song called Who Cares. Who care? No, 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 no. Not at the Cavern, he didn't. Uh, okay. Well, let at. Me, um, um, let me get the. Let at me, Abbey Road, he did. At Abbey Road, he did, but he didn't do who he didn't do. He didn't do it at uh, at uh, the Cavern. Uh, uh, hang on, let me see if I can. Let me see if I can quickly locate it here. Uh, Question: While you're looking for that, go ahead. Sheet, could the for you in the vernacular, Scouse vernacular, be for you? I mean, no, I, that's I mean, a good. That's a good question. You know, I don't. I. I don't because it, the person who told me the person I talked to that was at the show thought she remembered it to be a kind of a love song. Yeah, that, I mean that's that's Scouse for you. I. You know, it's also this is Brooklyn. For you. There you go. It is. <laughs> and Which so you know. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So okay. I mean, it's a possibility. Okay. So confidant, um, come on to me. Uh, who cares? So confidant, come on to you. Uh, who cares? And Fayou were the four new songs at uh, the cavern. Okay, um, so we now, did do that. <laughs> no, he did. Who cares? Uh, that's what that's I what said. <laughs> oh, okay. Duh. Never mind. But anyway, he um, the show was filmed and recorded. I've seen pictures that Giles Martin was there. Um, I heard reports that Giles did the recording. Um, which would indicate that the show is going to that show, the Cavern show, will be released. Mm-hmm. When it, nobody's confirmed that, and I've tried to tried to find that out, and nobody said anything. But that seems to be what's going on there. Mm. So, and from what I heard, the very first song that they started the show with was Twenty Flight Rock," and he stopped it in the middle of it because. The fans were told not to film anything or take pictures, and some of them were, and Paul was not too happy about that. Right. It's the second song in, he 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 did. He pointed to people, and he he said, you were told not to film, and, and they did. And uh, the person I talked to that was there said after that nobody dared pull their, pull their phone out, although there is – videos uh there are videos floating around of just briefly of you know of that show but nothing extensive mm-hmm. so that did work i had a full report on billboard for anybody that wants to see it with the with the full set list so and the, okay. the story the story i got the the person that uh that i interviewed was an american who took a chance on flying from New York City. See, Ken, you could have flown. You could have done it. And flew from New York City and was able to get it to, got a hotel room and a ticket. Wow. Ooh. And she took, a, she took a chance and it worked out for her. She said she heard about the show ahead of time. She said, if I'm going to take a chance, this is it. And she did, and she, she got there. Well, she stood right her. in front of him, and she handed, it, handed him a bouquet of flowers at the end. Yeah. <laughs> That's an awfully big risk. <laughs> it is. And awfully she said it cost her cost her quite a bit of money. Uh, uh-huh. but yeah, it's uh it's her name is Marianne Laffin. Uh Marianne, if you're listening, thank you for the interview. And I also spoke to uh Jean Catherell who was there at the nineteen ninety nine show. Mm-hmm. So it uh it worked out very well. The uh, and and if he indeed uh releases this it'll be great i know that 1999 show the one with david gilmore uh was uh, an excellent show that was a wonderful show so well, alan was at that i was were you yes oh. remember mm-hmm. alan ah, was i remember that. it well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it was a good show um I, I think i was a little disappointed that it that a show at the cavern you know not having been in that venue 
um, which of course isn't the real cavern. It's next door to right. the real cavern. The real, the real right. cavern is now parking lot, um, which we had to line up in before going in. So we kind of were on the cavern and then mm-hmm. in the new cavern, you know, and you walk down the stairs and you're in a replica of the cavern with the arch, you know, where they played under. But where they have concerts is actually in a big room inside, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was sort of expecting the concert to be under the arch, and it would be sort of like, you know, like the footage you see of some other guy. But in fact, it was just in a somewhat bigger room. I mean, bigger. It only holds like 250 people with, you know, just a regular stage. But, you know, I mean, that's a pretty minor disappointment. As disappointments go, it was kind of a, a thrill to see him in that space. Uh-huh. In '99, mm. um, yeah. so Gene is lucky. I mean, Gene must be one of the relatively few people who have seen both of those shows, right? Wow! So. I saw her there in '99. <laughs> talk oh, did her. you? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I knew her from online, and um, yeah, I've known Gene for a long time too. So, anyway, and actually, in between those two shows, Paul paid a visit at Lipa, where he did a Q and A on Facebook. Which I still haven't seen. I would imagine, hopefully, all of you got to see it. He also did a Q and A before the Abbey Road show, also online, and then he went back to Lipa for the graduation. Mm-hmm. The after the Lipa event, so he went right. back a second time. Yeah, and I know now Rogers got some kind of an award there, mm-hmm. and um, and after the Q and A, there was another performance. And when I looked at the set list, I mean, this this surprised me so much more than the two other shows, because if you look at the set list, it's a lot like Paul's Unplugged show (laughs) on MTV. You know, I was really surprised. Um, I'm just going to read it real quick because it's only 12 songs. I've just seen a face. San Francisco Bay Blues. uh, Every night. The big shocker for me, from me to you. Hmm. which he's never done live in his solo career. Um, also, Mrs. Vanderbilt, he brought back On My Way to Work, which he only performed once ever live in concert, and I got to see it. He was doing a concert in Albany. Love Me Do, Confidant, the new song. I Lost My Little Girl, Midnight Special, Blackpool, which is interesting since he never released that song, and We Can Work It Out. So most of those songs he actually did on MTV's Unplugged. It was like returning to that show, in a way. Hmm. Don't you think that's an interesting set list, guys? Mm-hmm. Yeah. For me to you, especially. especially. Yeah, especially. I, had, I, had, I hadn't heard that set list before. Wow. And For Love Me, me Do. You. Because, I mean, all the years that he complained about Love Me Do being a bit too high in the register and being uncomfortable for him to sing, since it was originally John's song, and... Uh, you know, that that's interesting that that's one that he chooses. He did love me do at the cavern too though. Uh um, yeah. so I maybe maybe this is something that maybe he's working out uh you know, something for the tour. Well Love Me Do he did on the last tour. Yeah. So it's not anything new, but it's just interesting that, you know, he's doing it now in the surroundings. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, at um I'm not sure if he did it at the at the cavern. But anyway, he did do it last on the last tour. Let me do. So he's probably going to bring it back again on, on the new tour. Good. All right. Mm-hmm. And it means he's probably deep six the wretched PS Love Me Do. <laughs> yeah, God, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. There is one other piece of news that's not Beatle news, though, and I'm going to just make a very short mention of it that uh, Mike Nesmith announced that he had had quadruple bypass surgery, and he is still going out on tour, actually in September with the first national band, Redux. And then he's supposed to go back out uh, at the first of the year with Mickey Dolenz again. And by the, and I've heard the first national band, Redux, live at the Troubadour. In fact, I wrote a review on it last night that will be up on Access today. And it's a great album. It re- he really sounds good. So, um, But anyway, that's the end of that. That's all I'm going to say about that. So, mm-hmm. And there's one more thing that I have, and that's that Yoko Ono will have a new album coming out. Oh, and Yoko, Yoko just started back with the Q&As on, um, P, on the uh, Imagine Peace uh, website. Mm-hmm. 
which is a great sign. That's a great thing. I just discovered that this morning. And that's uh, fantastic uh, that she's doing that. And then the yeah the album is um, is new version reimaginings of old songs. Right. But yeah, but that's great that she's she's doing that again. I'm glad to I was glad to hear that that she's doing that. Yeah, her new album's going to be called War Zone, and uh, it's 13 songs reimaginations of those songs. First released between 1970 and 2009. And she's supposed to be premiering a new track every Tuesday on that website, right. imaginepeace.com. <laughs> so um, a few songs that she's reimagined would be Now or Never, Woman Power, I Love All of Me, I Love You Earth, and she also does Imagine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the album comes out October 19th on Chimera Records, which is Sean's label, actually. Mm -hmm. So good news there from Yoko, keeping active. All right. Anything else you got for us, Steve? Nope. That's it. All right. So then on with the show. And as I said, Jude Kessler is our special guest. She has a brand new book now out, the fourth in her series of narrative books on John Lennon called Should Have Known Better, which I believe is going to be premiering at the Fest for Beatle fans in Chicago which is the weekend of August 10th through the 12th, the Regency, the Hyatt Regency O'Hare. And I guess that's the, the first opportunity for people to buy it, Jude? It is. People have been very gracious and kind to pre-order the book over the last few years. You know, printing, especially today with the shortage of paper that we're, we're experiencing, is astronomical. And it takes about $12,000 to publish one of these books. So people have been extremely kind. We've had about 300, a few more than 300 pre-orders over the last year and a half. And that really helps to get the book out. But they will be able to purchase the book for the first time at the Fest. Mark and Carol Lapidos, who've really been like family to me over the last few years, have been gracious to offer to do the book release party. So we're going to have it at 10, 15 in the morning. We're going to have great live music by Scott Erickson. I know you guys oh. all know Scott. He does mm -hmm. a beautiful job. He's going to do a nice linen set. And we're going to give away door prizes after every song, really celebrate John's life. And people will be able to get their book signed by the cover artist, who is my husband, Ran, Susan Durbacher from New England, who did gorgeous illustrations for the book. John Trusty, who is one of the people featured in the book because he partied with the Beatles in Key West, and he has a very unique and touching story, and he'll be there. And then by me. So you get four of the people involved in the book to sign it that day. So I think it's going to be fun, and we're going to share John Trusty's chapter and let people hear what happened to him and how it changed his life. So I think it'll be a, a fun way to kick off the morning at 1015. Mm-hmm. Now, altogether, how many volumes will there be of the John Lennon well, series? Ideally, I would like for there to be nine volumes because, you know, John's affinity and connection with nine, that was my plan. But this book, I know you and I talked about this, Ken, on your show, it really just got out of control. The Beatles did so much in 1964 between coming to America for Ed Sullivan, doing A Hard Day's Night, the World Tour, the North American Tour, the UK Tour, Beatles for Sale, John's book, not to mention the interviews and television appearances, and John moving into Kenwood and remodeling. And the book was so thick that I reached 1,025 pages, and they were just up to December of 1964. So I had to stop and make that into two books. So I, I, I'm afraid they're actually going to be 10 in the series now. Okay. Wow. So uh, I thought that this, this book goes as far as through March of 65, right? It doesn't. It actually ends the 1st of January, 1965. And oh, okay. We even had to remove a couple of things because it was just so lengthy. We you know, want to make sure, number one, that we cover things thoroughly and we don't give a cursory treatment to any topic. There are over 3,000 footnotes, so people are really getting every detail of what happened. But also that you know we don't make the book so large that people can't handle them, they can't stay together. We both stitch and glue the books. But, you know, I want this to be something people can collect as well as delve into. Mm. Okay. So I'm just going to start with a, a fairly simple question. 
And that is that, um, well, I think one of the many reasons why we are all so fascinated with the Beatles is that not only did they change radically musically within a very short period of time, but they also changed as people. I mean, they really grew up before our eyes. And, um, you know, so much, like you just said, Jude, could be packed in one year alone. And I always remember John talking about how I won the war. And when he was involved with the filming of that, it was the first time he actually asked himself the question, what will I do after the Beatles or without the Beatles? So my main question to you is for this particular year, 1964, what was the change, if any? Were there many changes in John personality wise or how he handled his fame? Was he already getting a bit uh, weary this early on of Very. Being a, uh, of being a Beatle? Very weary. You have nailed it. Let's just talk about March and April of 1964. John's getting up at about 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, which is unheard of in a Beatles life. And he's eating something and going to the studio where they're putting, they're doing makeup and hair for about an hour. And by 8 a.m., the cameras are rolling for a hard day's night. At lunchtime, many days, reporters come in and do interviews with them, or they're off to the Dorchester Hotel for the Variety Club Award, or Ed Sullivan is flying in from America to interview them, or they are recording things that they're going to use on radio or television. Go back to work after lunch. They work. The cast and crew goes home at 5 o'clock. The Beatles stay until about 7, 7.30 and p- finish and polish things up. Then they're off to do a Ready, Steady, Go or some other television special. Or they are giving John, who is putting out a book at the end of March in his own right, is doing additional interviews to promote his book. When he comes home at night, Tom Ashler is waiting for him. They're living in Emperor's Gate still at this point in Kensington. And Tom is waiting to help John edit the book, to finish his illustrations, and really to look over his shoulder and make sure that that book is completed in a timely manner. So he's rolling into bed around midnight, sleeping until five and getting up and doing it over and over and over again. And even by the spring of 64, before they even embark on the world tour, before Brian comes up with this brilliant idea of having them do live shows every Sunday throughout the summer to get back in the public eye, and before they leave for America for that North American tour, which is a killer, he's already tired. But once they return from North America, immediately they get four or five days off, they're back in the studio, they're recording Beatles for sale, and then the UK tour, which sweeps them back to their past, back to the days when they're staying in very inexpensive lodgings, eating on the tables in front of the mirrors in the dressing rooms, very frugal tour. They're back to their beginnings and no one complains, but they are exhausted. And John is exhausted. And we won't even go into the changes that are happening in his marriage. But by the the end of 1964, you're beginning to see the fissure that turns into the split that finally divides John and Cynthia. So it's a landmark year and it's it's a weary, weary year for him. Mm. Would you say John, more so than the others, grew tired of this? Uh, this lifestyle, because you always get the impression that Paul loved everything. You know, Paul loved being a Beatle. He loved getting all the attention. He loved being on stage. He loved performing. And I think, you know, George and Ringo, let, let's let's remember, this is the first year they conquered America. It had to be really exciting for these four guys. But well, for John, was it much less so? I think the person who was most sick of it was George Harrison. In fact, George Martin had to have a pep talk with Harrison when he returns to do Beatles for Sale because he's he's bitter, he's tired, he's sick of being pushed around by people, he's sick of having to say the right thing, he's sick of being told by Brian that they can't smoke in public, Pat Boone airbrushing their cigarettes out of their hands and pictures that he's doing of them without their permission. He's tired of the sham of it all. And, and George really has become extremely bitter about the touring and is vocal about not wanting to tour again. Second in line is John, and, and John is getting fed up with it, too. John is, is strangely enough, because I, pe- I know people don't think of John this way, but John was also homesick. 
Larry Kane, Art Schreiber, Ira Davis, all of the reporters on the North American tour will tell you point blank, he was calling Cynthia every single night, never missed a night calling home. He was homesick. He says in many interviews when they say, what would you like to do that you haven't done on the tour thus far? He says, go home. I want to go home. And he says it repeatedly and people get insulted. Well, you don't like being here. I like being here. But how would you feel if you'd been gone from your family for this many days? I want to go home. So John second, but you're absolutely right, Ken. Ringo laps it up. He loves that on the very last night in Dallas, he says, I wish we could start all over again and do this all over again. He loves it. And Paul eternally loves it. It's Paul's bailiwick. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, we all know how George Harrison felt in 66 about touring. He yeah. really wanted it to end, but I wasn't aware in 64 that he already felt that way. Not so Very. much ending the tour, ending touring, but being tired of performing yeah, so and soon. Being, being tired of told what to do and what not to do. And he really, I mean, they he sits down with George Martin right before, the, after the first day of Beals for Sale. George says, what's wrong with you? Yeah, I can see that you, you're you unhappy. He comes in late. He's several hours late to the recording. He's just not himself. And once they're back in the studio, he begins to relax. By the time that they are on the UK tour, he's resting. He's returning to himself. But look, those boys were pushed far too hard. Mm. Um it was something that, you know, and I work 10, 12 hours a day, but to always be in the public eye and to have to say the right thing. And if you do the least thing wrong, and some of it wasn't even their fault, when they landed in Milwaukee, they were supposed to land at General Mitchell Field. But someone, and we're really not sure who it was in all their wisdom, had them land across on the other side of the field at the National Guard headquarters. And instead of going by the fans and waving, as they always did, they were whisked away straight to the hotel. Well, that became the turning point of the North American tour. From then on, the press was on the Beatles like white on rice. They, you know, you don't like the fans. You don't respect the fans. You don't care about the fans. And it went from a love affair and a honeymoon to a persecution of the Beatles. Look at the interviews prior to Milwaukee and the interviews after Milwaukee. Suddenly, the worm had turned and the press was after the Beatles big time. And George got tired of it. And a couple of times he smarted off to them, of course, John was credited with having said the things that George said, but that's one of the things that I try to set the record straight about in the book is that George was fed up and he's very, very vocal about it. In fact, at one point, someone says something nasty to him and he responds with, well, I, if I were as fat and ugly as you are, you know, he's he's fed up. And mm -hmm. it's 64, so he had a long road ahead of him before someone listens to his complaints. Yeah, it's so amazing to think that that happened so early on. It really is. Yeah. So uh, we always do like a roundtable discussion here. And so next up, we'll have Alan ask you something. Okay, yeah, I wanted to pick up it with that same area, really, because it, it, it is kind of surprising to learn that by 64 they were already fed up because publicly, you know, it's true, Some you could pick up on some of the things that you've said, the, the, the quips in interviews that are less cheerful than they usually yeah. are, but, but the, there wasn't that much of that. And in 64, they still seem to be enjoying it. The summer tour was a bit grueling. Um, and the the only thing I've ever seen that made me see how tired they were was basically the Beatles for Sale album. We talked about that when we talked about the album a few weeks ago. To me, the fatigue is just palpable in that music. It is. Yeah. Uh, did you um, – was there a, a lot of that in the sessions or did, as you said, uh, after George Martin's pep talk and George settling into recording, he began to feel better? I mean, did, did recording revitalize them a bit? Yeah, they definitely always loved being at home in the studio and, and things got better as they – kept going in the studio, but, you know, they had been given no time to write Beatles for sale. 
when you think about the fact that they are performing and many times getting straight on a plane and flying to the next city during the North American tour. And when they get there, there's a host of DJs and journalists and people waiting for them in every city. You know, Brian says no special guests. No one is to bother the Beatles. And in every city you have celebrities waiting for them. They never had a moment to themselves, and yet somehow they do sit down and begin to work on eight days a week and and to do some Carl Perkins-esque songs and to do this country and Western tribute, which is going to become Beatles for Sale, but it's half-hearted at best because they're exhausted. And so creating has been pushed to the bottom of the barrel, and look, Alan, That's what they did this for. Mm. They did it to create, to write their songs, to sing their songs. And suddenly, you know, as George said, we're just performing fleas. And then, you know, John said, no one even listens to us anymore. There's one moment, one beautiful moment on the North American tour in which people actually hear them. And it's in Indianapolis outside that night at the second concert that they do under the stars. Mm the teens sit down and they listen and they sing along. And it gives me goosebumps thinking about it because under the stars that night, they get to be the Beatles that they wanted to be. They hear people singing their songs. They are respected. They're heard, but that rarely happens. And George Harrison said, do you know what the Beatles concerts have become? They've become a reason for kids to riot. Right. They're using this as an excuse to riot. And, you know, that's not what we wanted. And imagine, you think about the things they were throwing on the stage. They threw a can of fruit at Paul at one point, a tin can. Think of that, it hit him in the head, what could have happened. They threw a raw steak at him in Chicago. They are throwing lipstick cases and, of course, the jelly beans, and they are at one point, Paul has a black eye because a jelly bean has hit him right in that soft part of the eye underneath the eyeball. Mm-hmm. You've asked people over and over again not to throw things at you, but they keep doing it. I mean, after a while, you really become tired of it all. I mean, night after night after night, you're scared. Of course, there's the death threat at Red Rocks. Brian, as scared as he is of heights, climbs that tower overlooking the stage to look down and check on the boys. And many times they're terrified. It just, it was a very difficult experience. And Beatles for Sale is the product of that long journey that leaves them so fatigued. It's hard to do what they set out to do, and that's create. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then about John and Cynthia. Um, You talk about John calling Cynthia every night, but we also know from a number of sources that he was out carousing quite a lot, too, with um, you know, women they ran into on tour. Um, I don't know how to put it, but you know, there we are. Um, yeah, <laughs> so it, it's kind of it's kind of a duality, right? You know, he's uh, on one hand, Mrs. Cynthia. On the other hand, he's you know just sort of out there doing whatever yeah. he wants. And it was was that part of the beginning of the fissure, or was it other things? Well, I mean, Cynthia knew from the very earliest trips to Hamburg what was going on, and she chose not to focus on it. Mm -hmm. She said, you know, I could say something to John about this. I could bring it up. She says it very clearly in her second book, John. But if I do, he's going to be angry. And how will that solve my problem? How will that help me? I have to focus on the fact that he loves me enough to be married to me. He comes home to me. He shares his dreams with me. He talks about his problems with me. I'm the one that he really cares about. I know what's going on, but I choose to say nothing about it. John, no one, Alan, knows more than you do about John's personality and the fact that John could be one night literally crawling out of a brothel with the police taking them down into the red light districts Mm -hmm. of Europe. And then the next very next day, flying Cynthia in to spend the last night with him before they depart for the world tour. He doesn't have to fly her in. 
he could have just continued having fun. But he purposely has his wife flown in so that he can spend the night with her before he leaves on world tour. He is coming on to Ronnie Spector. He is definitely having an affair with Sonny Freeman because he's confronted. I mean, he, he is they come down, they come to John's apartment in Emperor's Gate. They send Cynthia out of the room. And when they leave, there are tears and Sonny is upset and embarrassed. And Cynthia says, what were they here talking to you about, John? And he says, never mind, and walks off and won't explain to her what's happened. So she knew it. Everyone knew it. But he still loves Cynthia, chooses to be married to her. He never seemed to connect the dots between fidelity and that marriage partnership. And she didn't want to connect any dots because connecting the dots would mean having to do something about it. So it becomes, as the year goes along, it becomes increasingly difficult. And he's very unhappy living at Kenwood. He really doesn't want to leave London and wants to be able to go to the Scotch of St. James and bag of nails. But he sees that Cynthia deserves to have privacy and Julian deserves to have privacy. And so that is his compromise. I'm going to go on tours. I'm going to see the world, but I'm going to leave you in a safe place. But, you know, it's very inconvenient to move to Kenwood and very unhappy for him because many nights, Paul, George and Ringo go out partying and he can't go because he has to go home. Hmm. So he felt trapped in a way. He did. Yeah, he did. And it's a it's the same dichotomy you have from day one, because he doesn't have to marry Cynthia. He volunteers. He says, you know, there's nothing for it. We have to get married, Sin. And but then he goes and cries to Mimi and says, I'm too young. I don't want to get married. But then he does get married. And, you know, it's a very complicated relationship. Mm hmm. OK, a little more about the the series generally. Um, you had said you were you wanted it to be nine books for you know the obvious reasons, and now it will be ten. It it, it seems to me that with the whole rest of the Beatle era in front of you, um, it may be more than ten, um, <laughs> because of the experience you had with this one. Probably will be replicated in sixty five at least, uh, if not sixty six. But how do you determine, like, did, did you have a floor plan at the start of the series of what each volume was going to include? Or have you just sort of been winging it, you know, going, going through and then saying, okay, this is, this is now more than enough for a book and we have to cut it here? No, I, I definitely had a plan how it was going to be divided through the years and exactly how it was going to be presented. In fact... I have it right in front of me, should have been there, of course, was 1940 through December of 61, because those are the formative years Mm -hmm. up to the point where Brian offers them that loose managerial agreement on the 10th of December 61. And the stage is set. Everybody is in place except for Ringo and Ringo's there. He's just not part of the band. Mm -hmm. Then Shivering Inside is December 61 to May of 63. You're getting the rise to fame in Britain and Germany and really all of all of that part of Great Britain, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, but nothing in America yet, other than Swan and VJ and that sort of thing. You're not really getting the big hitters. She Loves You is May of 63 to March of 64, the outbreak of Beatlemania, the royal performance for the for the royal family on the 4th of November, 63, the Palladian, playing the Palladian, knowing that they're coming to America, Ed Sullivan, that whole bit, then this book was supposed to be March of 64 through November of 1966. Well, we certainly didn't hit that (laughs) mark, you know. I mean, there's no way. But people were so, so gracious. I was able to get so many primary interviews with people like Art Schreiber and Beetle Bob Berry and Gene Loving from Virginia Beach who traveled to the New Musical Express with Louise Harris and and went to Liverpool with her and then met the Beatles and all of these people who are contributing these primary source stories. And you don't want to say no. You want to include as much as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. But it's just it's huge. So now we have um, Shades of Life for the new book, which is hopefully going to cover all of 65 
perhaps a little bit of 66. She said, she said, which will be August of 66 through September of 1969, Strawberry Fields, the early 70s, up to the lost weekend. Surprise, surprise, the lost weekend up to January of 1975. Steel and Glass, January of 75 to 78, and then Shine On, 78 to December of 1980. If I can stick to that, it's a great plan, but my main concern is not adhering to that schedule. It is telling John's story accurately and as thoroughly as I possibly can tell it. So as you're working on each book, you must also have to be researching for several volumes ahead, right? Just because people are getting older and you know you want to catch them while they're still talking. That's they're right. Talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and remember. Right, right. Yeah. So in that period of, 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 you know, 75 to 78 and 78 to 80, is, um, is, is that a particularly difficult section? I, I would think so just offhand, just because he wasn't public. But what are you, what are you finding for that period? That period, I really have not done much research on at all, because I have been so busy trying to capture the next four or five years, Mm -hmm. talking to people who actually went back on the North American tour in 65, and who were a part of the making of help, and were there when John was struggling with what to include in Spaniard in the Works because he's put all of his best things into In His Own Right. He's trying to find his stories. They've all disappeared. Bill Harry's trying to help him find them. So I've been working ahead about four or five years, and I haven't moved on to that section yet. Talked to several people who said, when you get there, I'll be glad to help you. May Pang has been extremely helpful and She's many, many times has stepped in and helped me. And so I know that she will always be a great source. But, you know, you're right. It, it is hard. There are only so many hours in a day. And if you are trying to do a thorough job on the work at hand, but you have to keep a side eye on the fact that you don't want to lose those interviews, you're always juggling the present with the future. Mm-hmm. So for this book, I mean, you've talked to, for instance, um, stewardesses who accompany them on the tour on the plane. And um, I'm wondering, first of all, how did you run into those people and find them? Um, the story, the Walnut Ridge story was one that was not covered very well because the Beatles obviously were only there for a few hours on in the wee hours of September the 19th. They've played Dallas. They're finished with the North American tour, and now they're going to go to Alton, Missouri for a few days of rest and relaxation before they go to do their charity gig in New York and then return to start making a hard day's night. So when I began researching the story of what happened when they flew into Walnut Ridge, I was told and I know people in Walnut Ridge because I participate in Beatles at the Ridge every year. I run the Authors and Artists Symposium. And so one of the people who was very involved with the story was a, a boy. He's now a grown man, H.T. Moore, who was a young journalist mm-hmm. for the Walnut Ridge newspaper. And he received a call early one Saturday morning from a guy named Gene Matthews. And Gene said, H.T., H.T. is 16 or 17 at this point. I know something you don't know about the Beatles. And he's like, "Eh, okay, whatever. He's like, no, they're here in Walnut Ridge. And H.T. Moore says, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, right. And he goes, well, if you don't believe me, call your friend and he names someone because she she got their autograph last night. So H.T. Moore follows up, makes a second call, finds out, sure enough, the Beatles did land in Walnut Ridge the night before. Well, Gene Matthews told this story to this girl who told the story to someone else who told the story to HT. And as I begin to backtrack and find out that the three boys who went to the airport to meet the Beatles that Friday night were Bobby Cole, Richard Thomas, and Gene Matthews. And I begin to get the stories from their families and from them about what happened. The very first story that unravels is that when the Beatles landed, they're coming from Dallas. It's Brian's 30th birthday. They're toasting him on the plane and they're wearing their cowboy hats because they're going to a ranch in Missouri. When they land, hookers 
prostitutes come flying off the plane, short skirts such as these people in Walnut Ridge have never seen before, and it's a scandal, and their eyes are bugging out. Well, actually, in truth, as I began to research it, there was actually one female on that plane, and that was Ruby Hickman, who was the executive for American Flyers Airlines, have a photograph of the suit that she had on. It was very modest and sedate. She was a very well-respected female executive in 1964. That's the only female who got off the plane that night. The next story, and this was repeated in a Life magazine special on the Beatles, was that the stewardesses went to the ranch for the weekend with the boys. And it's broadly hinted that there was some hanky-panky going on. Well, through John Trusty, the gentleman who partied with the Beatles in Key West and who spoke to John Lennon and did not understand what John Lennon meant when John looked at him and said, would you care for a fag? John (laughs) Trusty went, no, I'm here to pick up chicks. (laughs) Well, It broke his heart when he realized that John had just been making an overture of friendship to him. And John laughed, chuckled, didn't really give him a hard time about it, and walked away. Well, John Trusty, having lost out on the opportunity to make friends with John Lennon, spent the rest of his life getting to know every single person associated with that 1964 tour. The members of the Bill Black Combo, the Exciters, Frogman Henry, everyone who was on that tour, and he made friends with Eva Zavala and Betty Westmoreland, who were the stewardesses on board the plane. Mm -hmm. Years and years ago, John Trusty came up to me at a Chicago Fest for Beatles fans and said, when you get to 1964, I have a story to tell you, and I have telephone numbers for you and photographs and things that I think you need to see. Well, I'd heard so many erroneous stories and people had put themselves in places where they never actually were Mm -hmm. that I was skeptical. But I started hearing the story that John Trusty told, and he did put me in touch with Eva Zavala, and he did put me in touch with with Betty Westmoreland Birdsell, these two stewardesses. I drove, I met them, I got their stories, and I began to find out that the other story that was going around was that these three boys with a fifth of Jack Daniels, drove around that night, all night long with the Bill Black Combo and drank Jack Daniels and partied. Well, no, the Bill Black Combo, according to Reggie Young, another person that John Trusty put me in touch with, America's guitar player, the, the great, great guitar player for the Bill Black Combo, Reggie Young said, we never even went to Walnut Ridge, Jude. We went straight from Dallas to London because the next day we were going on tour with Billy J. Kramer. So we never set foot in Walnut Ridge. We didn't ride around and drink Jack, Jack Daniels with anyone. <laughs> the The only person out of the Bill Black Combo who flew into Walnut Ridge was Bill Reed. Bill's wife was having a baby in Memphis. He did fly in. So originally, I had Bill written into the story as riding around with Bobby Cole, Richard Thomas, and Gene Matthews and drinking this fifth of Jack Daniels. Well, Bill Reed didn't do that. Bill Reed went to Alton, Missouri with the Beatles and spent the weekend. How do I know that? Because I got to talk with Reed Pigman Jr., the young man who was 14 and a half years old, whose parents owned the ranch. And he was there when Bill Reed showed up and signed the guest book, staying with them Saturday, Saturday night and leaving on Sunday morning. He said, Bill Reed didn't ride around with them. He came straight on the plane with my dad and Ruby Hickman flying into Alton, Missouri and spent the weekend with us. So then I had to take Bill Reed completely out of the story. No members of the Bill Black Combo rode around and drank Jack Daniels. That never happened. The only person who rode with those three boys was Cliff Bonifield, the co-pilot, who went directly to Snap's Alamo Motel and spent the night and the next day told the story of the Beatles landing in Walnut Ridge to that young boy, H.T. Moore, who tracked him down. He knew that the pilot had to have stayed somewhere in town, and he found him and got the information that on Sunday morning, if I were you, I wouldn't go to Sunday school or church. I would go to the airport if you want to get the rest of your story. So it 
bit by bit, one person introduces me to the next person, and that person introduces me to the next person, and the story begins to take shape. But it's very difficult because a lot of people want to make the story bigger than it was, more fantastic, and you have to keep history pure. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to do. Hmm. Okay, great stuff. And I will turn you over now to Steve. Thank you, Alan. Um, hello, Jude. Um, hey. You were. Uh, uh, I, I was. I was looking through the book, and I noticed you had a little incident between Brian and Murray the K. And I was one. And I mean, you know, we've heard the stories down through the years of how Murray called himself the Fifth Beetle. But did you ever? Uh, did you get any? Did you get any inside stories of? you know, the whole Murray the K thing and how they really felt about him or, or did they, you know, were they polite enough to say, you know, we'll just live with it or, or did they actually kind of uh, really can, couldn't stand the way he was so pushy and was he kind of the uh, example of a lot of what they were going through? Yeah, and there's no doubt about that. I mean, you t look at people like Cousin Brucey, who are so – Cousin Brucey was smart, and he used that Ringo St. Christopher medal incident very wisely to get publicity mm -hmm. for his radio station. But Cousin Brucey was always a gentleman, always nice, always – was very courteous to Brian and to the Beatles and never really made himself a pest. Mm -hmm. You go back and listen to the interview that Beatle Bob Barry does with the Beatles in Milwaukee. And he says to them, well, I'd like to say I'm, I'm the fifth Beatle, but Murray the K has already taken that title and they all groan and they're like, oh, you know. <laughs> He, I mean, he's so pushy and he and he brings himself over to do the DJ work for the new musical express concert. Right. Oh, my God. Or he's that pushy. That over introduction there. is awful. Oh, you know, it's he is the epitome of everything that was wrong about what the news was doing. But the embedded journalists who tour with the Beatles were all stellar. You have Art Schreiber, who was with the Westinghouse Network. And Art missed the first week of the tour because he was asked to cover the Democratic National Presidential Convention. So he misses that first week. But once he's there, he is becoming fast friends with John Lennon. He's playing Monopoly and staying up with him every night, even though Art has to post five stories at 8 a.m., five stories at noon, and five stories at 8 p.m. Imagine what that took. I said, Art, were they, were they the same stories? He said, no, no, no. I had to write five different stories three times a day. I was like, oh, my gosh, what a workload. But he is such a gentleman, a friend of the Beatles, so much so that in Cleveland, when the concert is stopped, what does John do? He says, Art, come with us. And has Art go live on the air to tell their side of what happened at that Cleveland concert. Ivor Davis, very kind to them, good to them, is the ghostwriter for George in his Daily Express column. And when George says, you know, this column you're writing, Ivor, is a load of old shite. Ivor says, well, that's because you won't give me any time, George. If you talk to me and make friends with me, I could write in your voice. And so they start hanging out together and become good friends. A lot of these journalists who were with them and the photographers, Ron Joy, Kurt Gunther, they are wonderful people, but they're hand selected. When you're talking Murray the K, you're talking someone who's inserted himself into the story, not someone that Brian selected. So that's a different breed. Mm -hmm. What was uh, just? Uh, I know you know this was probably the most intense year, sixty four. Would you say that first of all was it the most intense year, or did it get worse as the years went, as say sixty five and sixty six went on? Well, I think sixty five is going to be even worse because it's not going to be new. You know, mm -hmm. y you've done a movie, and so now we're doing it again. You've been on a world tour, and now we're doing it again. You've done a North American tour again. So the new has worn off. And by the end of 65, Paul and John are becoming a little contentious. At one point, John is pouring his heart out to Ray Coleman in, the, in a dressing room. 
on the UK tour. And he's not talking to anyone but Ray Coleman, but he's saying, you know, I'm really sick of this. I'm tired of this food. I'm tired of eating in dressing rooms. I'm tired of the screaming. I'm tired of the jelly babies. I'm tired of, and Paul turns around and says, cheer up, John. I'm, I'm sick of you. And John says, just watch telly like a good little boy and leave me alone. I wasn't even talking to you. And Paul says, but you're bad for me image. In other words, the stuff you're telling Ray Coleman, who is a journalist, and Ray's not going to repeat it. He's John's friend. But that could end up in the press. You're bad for my image. I don't want you saying these things. I don't want you repeating these things. And John says, it's none of your business. And this happens two or three more times. In fact, at once Paul corrects him in public. So they are starting to get, you know, there's always been a problem with having two big dogs. From day one, when John goes home and he sits on his bed and mendips and he makes a decision about whether he's going to bring that talented, smart, savvy leader into his group. But he does it because he feels that it's what's right for the group. He knows this is going to happen. And it's wonderful that it doesn't happen until almost the end of 64. But from 64 on, the two of them are going to be at each other. And so, you know, I think it's going to get worse, not better. I mean, 64 is going to be just as draining. But now the newness is worn off. They'd always wanted... I mean, you know, we we'd heard the stories about uh, where we go and Johnny to the top. Yeah. And uh, but I wonder if maybe the end result of just how crazy it got was more than they wanted. Was that more than do you think that was more than they wanted? I don't think it was more than they wanted. It wasn't what they wanted. They did not imagine that nobody would listen to them. John's main complaint over and over is no one is listening to the music. And then Cynthia would say, but they are listening to the music. They're listening at home on their records. They're listening on the television shows. They're listening on the films. They're just not listening when you want them to listen. They're not listening when you sing. It wasn't the Cavern Club amplified. It was, as George Harrison said, that reason to riot. And and John understands that because when he's a teenager, he goes to see Rock Around the Clock because he's heard that in London they're ripping up the theater seats. And he's primed to rip up the theater. And then no one does it. They just sit there and eat their popcorn. He's (laughs) really disappointed, you know. But he understands it theoretically. But when it's happening to you and you are the one putting your talent out there and no one is listening and they're throwing things at you and they're crying and screaming and jumping and running and no one is listening, it wasn't what he thought it was going to be. And it is increasingly, don't say this, don't say that. Of course, later on, don't mention the Vietnam War, don't talk politics, don't say the things you're not supposed to say. From the very first moment that Brian says you're going to bow from the waist and tighten the tie, it's not what he wanted. And at the end of volume one, should have been there, John won't go into the grapes to that party. He won't go in and celebrate because he thinks he has sold the Beatles out. I have said, right then, Brian, manage us. But was that the right decision? Did I give away my authenticity? So it really wasn't what he wanted. Hmm. That's really that's really interesting. So then, as, as after sixty four, you to get back to what you were saying a little earlier, it actually gets crazier in sixty five. It doesn't it doesn't get any easier. No, no. I mean, what what improves? It's the same schedule that they had in sixty four, but now it's trite. Now it's the same old, same old. So mm-hmm. you know, I mean, and tensions increase, and John becomes more who he is in the public eye. George becomes more who he is in the public eye, and that stands in direct conflict with who Paul wants them to be. Paul wants them to say the right things, do the right things. He always is busy. You can imagine the panic that Paul is going through when he's thinking, "I've got to make this right." And I've got to cover up for anything that's said. And meanwhile, they're thinking, we've had it. We are going to say what we want to say. And it's it's a difficult premise in 65. How did their music not suffer, though? Because it didn't. That's really the amazing part is that the music didn't suffer. Yeah, because that's the outlet. That's the one place where they're happy. That's the one place where they are who they are. 
Uh, I just wrote a little blog for the Fest for Beatles fans about why do people want to do that every six months? Why do you want to return every six months to the same event? I'll tell you why, because that's the only place where people know who you really are. You're not a researcher. You're not a businessman. You're not a grandfather. You're not a dad. You are a Beatles fan. And a couple of three years ago, someone yelled at me across the lobby of one of the hotels at the Fest for Beatles fans, hey, Lennon chick. And <laughs> I wasn't insulted. I wasn't put off by it. I didn't feel diminished. What I thought was when you go to the Fest for Beatles fans, people know you for who you are. You are that fan that you were when you were 14, 16, 18, they see you in your real clothing, your real self. Right. And the studio was where those boys got to be who they really were. So that's the only place where they can be themselves. And so they pour every bit of devotion and talent and love that they have into those songs. That's when they're happy. Okay. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Ken. This is fascinating stuff. You know, just to counter what you were talking about, Jude, about John feeling like he sold out by doing things like wearing the suits or, or, or whatever, I always remember Paul talking about this, saying that he didn't remember John feeling that way when he was asked to do that. He would have done anything, anything for the group to make it. So whatever yeah. he was told to do, you know, at that time, he agreed to it. Absolutely. He agreed to it. Of course, Paul says that years later, that quote comes from him years and years later. He did. John did agree to it. He was the first one to agree to it. In fact, Paul isn't even there when John agrees to it initially. And John would have done anything to get to the top, but that doesn't mean he liked it. You go back and look at that tie. It's always slightly loose. And the button is unbuttoned, not like Paul's tight, neat, pristine tie. And John is always the one that just slyly says something and then has to scratch his right sideburn because he said something inappropriate. He finds a way to slip it in there. He's right. Paul isn't lying about that. John would have done anything to get to the top, but he didn't do it gladly. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to ask you about the book that John wrote in his own right, and that came out in March of that year of 64. Do you think that John wanted to be taken seriously as an author? Because whenever I've seen interviews with John at the time talking about it, he's very lighthearted, almost like, you know, this is a little side project. It's not something to dwell on. It's just something he's doing on the side. Do you think he wanted to be looked at seriously as an author? I do. But John always tells you that things that matter to him don't matter. He tells you that it's just trash, that the book is junk, that it's about nothing. And that protects him when people, if people, would say the exact same thing. You know, I didn't really put anything into this. It's just a bit of stuff I scribbled. And yet, what is he doing when he's on the plane? He used to put slips of paper in his right pocket. And then he would take them out, write on them, and put them into his left pocket. He was constantly writing, constantly reading, constantly absorbing new ideas. Betty Westmoreland says John rarely talked to anyone, but he was always scribbling something, always writing something. He was a man apart. John very much wanted to be heard as the artist that he was. But of course, he always says, it doesn't matter. I don't care. I, you know, this is just a bit of dribble that I'm putting out there. But why does mm. he do it? Why does he write the Daily Howl? Why does he write the poems and verses? Why does he write the stories? Because he's telling you who he is. And if you go back and read in his own right, it's a very dark book. It's a book that tells you about the pain that he suffered, about his very dark view of life growing up and through his teen years. And he's telling you exactly who he is at the foils luncheon. When Brian finally stands up to give the speech that he was supposed to give from the very beginning. And that's a whole story that we cover in the book because it was just a misunderstanding. John thought Brian was going to deliver the postprandial speech. Brian assumes John's going to introduce him. John can't see him because he doesn't have his contacts on. So he doesn't introduce Brian and he stands up, scratches his cheek, does a sign of the cross twice and says, you've got a lucky face. Thank you very much. And sits down. Brian leaps to his feet, walks to the microphone and says, 
I want you to understand, I advise John not to do this. I did not think that writing a book in his spare time was the right thing to do. I thought it took away from his duties as a Beatle. I was against this. John wanted to write this book. John is the one who insisted. And any good and any beauty and any creativeness and anything significant that you see in this book that caused you to award him the Foils Literary Award, that is all John Lennon's doing, not mine and not anybody else's. So that's a very intentional thing. He is writing this book because it does matter to him, despite what he says. Mm. Okay. Well, we're winding down here in the show, so I think maybe I'll just ask Alan if he has anything left to ask, Jude. Okay. Um, this is a, a a very big general question, but um, since we're <laughs> winding down, you can be as concise as you like. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, having sort of looked through some of the through these books, and the the place where you are now is the middle of Beatlemania, um, and obviously after 1970, you'll be doing something else. But why did you choose? John rather than say the Beatles as a group or George Paul and Ringo what was it about John that made him the subject for you one of the stories that's in should have known better is the story of the day that I went to school and one of my friends walked up to me and said should have a cover of one of the Beatles 45s and said these are the Beatles and you have until recess to fall in love with one of them I was like what I, I was a very <laughs> serious kid and very studious kid. And I have until 1030 in the morning to fall in love with one of these people. And I was like, I, it was a foreign language to me in so many ways. And so initially I said, well, I don't know, I guess this guy and it was George and I could tell all my friends were disappointed. So I went home, I found out a little bit more about the Beatles, came back and the next day picked John Lennon and they were all happy about that decision. That's the Beatle we thought you were going to like. That's the smart Beatle. That's the leader Beatle, blah, 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 blah. And initially it was just because I was told to choose a Beatle and everybody was in love with the Beatle. But as I grew and began to read and learn John's story and to find out that this is a young man who for very complicated reasons, I'm not placing blame on anyone, but for complicated reasons was given away by the fist parents. I mean, his dad doesn't mean to. He thinks John's going home with Julia to live and he surrenders and Mimi tells him not to write any more letters and to complicate John's life. So he steps out. Then Julia, with the help of Pop Stanley, who is putting huge pressure on him to surrender John to her elder sister, Mimi, steps out of the picture and goes to live with John Dykins. So this little boy has lost his parents. He's living with an aunt who is very duty bound. And when he says, why are you here for me every day, Auntie Mimi, when I come home from school, she responds, because it is my duty to do so, not because I love you. So you have this little boy growing up. The only person who shows him any affection at all is his uncle, George, who, when John is 14 and a half and needs that male role model, dies of cirrhosis of the liver. And he's not even there for the funeral. They send John away to Scotland so that when he returns, he finds out his uncle is dead and has been buried and he doesn't even get to say goodbye to him. And, you know, then Julia comes back into his life, becomes his best friend, encourages him to skip school and hang out with her, tells him he has music in his bones and he should start a band, teaches him to play the banjo and the guitar, and then is hit by a drunk driver and killed and taken from him a second time. Look, that young man should have done nothing but be angry and bitter and hostile and ended up in the worst way. And yet he took that pain and transformed it into the soundtrack of our lives. That is a story worth people hearing. And that's why I wrote it as a historical narrative, because it's not just a story for Beatles fans. It's a story for anyone who feels as if they can't put one foot in front of the other, that life has been too mean to them. Yeah, life may have kicked you, but it kicked John Lennon a lot harder and look at what he did with it. Look at what he did with it. You know? Absolutely. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very understandable reason. Um, and I should turn you over to Steve for a final question. Well, I'll make it 
hopefully, I, I think it's relatively simple, Jude. What's the biggest takeaway that people will get from the new book? Probably the fact that perseverance is the name of the game. It's not just the toppermost of the poppermost anymore. It's not Thrill City. I mean, they're happy moments. They're, they're, they're elated moments in which the Beatles for the first time, ride through those streets of Adelaide and 200,000 people show up. They have the top down on the car and the crowd is so respectful. Fingers reaching out to touch the Beatles' fingers, people cheering, holding babies out for them to touch. They're happy moments. But the bulk of the work in 64 was just that work. It was getting up every day, putting in 10, 12, 14 hours a day, never being off camera, never being given the luxury of privacy, and yet they continued. They never quit working. They never had a free moment, and they endured. And I think that's that's my takeaway, because I'm getting ready to start again on book five, which for me means working. I work all afternoon, have a regular evening, start working again at midnight and work through until six in the morning, sleep a few hours and get up and do it again. I was at the end of the last book down to 87 pounds, exhausted, worn out. Ken, that's when I did your show. I probably sounded like a zombie. But um, and now, you know, I'm heading on to those years in which these have been the happy years. These are the up years. But when you start with 65, you start in the denouement. Things are going to are going to increasingly become more and more ground. But I'm going to do it because the example set for me by John Paul, George and Ringo, that example is endure. Thank you, Jude. Go ahead, Ken. All right. Jude, you have been a terrific guest as always, and we welcome you back anytime. And I want to let everyone know that Jude has her own website, which is johnlennonseries.com, where you can purchase the three previous books, volumes one through three, and now it's going to be volume four, and she'll be premiering it at the Fest for Beetle Fans, which is the weekend of August the 10th through the 12th at the Hyatt Regency O'Hare in Chicago. If you want more information about the Fest, you can go to their website, which is thefest.com. Anything you want to add, Jude? Thank you guys so much for having me. It is always an honor. I love, I've told Ken this before, it is a privilege to talk to people who ask brilliant questions and who really get down to the marrow of things. I think the thing that the Beatles hated most, and I have almost all of their interviews in this book, but the thing they dreaded most were the stupid questions like, what do you do with your hair in the shower? (laughs) And, you know, it it just, it, it irritated them so much, but to come on a show where people ask great questions, what a joy. Thank you so much. Well, I was going to say, yeah, you didn't, did you mention the dates for Beatles at the Ridge? Oh, yeah. We would love for people to come. And when you read the story of how this town was collapsing and folding and they took that one night that the Beatles stopped in Walnut Ridge and they made it the focus of the town, renamed all the streets after the Beatles, had this wonderful free Beatles festival and symposium. It changed the face of that town. That town just received an $80 million contract to build a defense facility because of John, Paul, George and Rick. And go. The Beatles changed that town. So come celebrate with them and be a part of a two-day symposium, September 14th and 15th. Vivek Tawari is the featured author this year. Dave Bedford, the featured artist. He's going to be showing his film, Looking for Lennon. And both Art Schreiber and Ivor Davis, who were on that 1964 North American tour, are going to be speaking on Friday night. It is going to be a great, great weekend. Dr. Ken O'Toole, Lena Stagg, Sarah Schmidt, uh, Marty Edwards, who was with the Beatles in Chicago in 1964, it's going to be great, and it's free, absolutely free. That's tremendous, and it's nice to see uh, how how the money was raised to help the city out. It was a miracle. I mean, they everything was boarded up, Main Street was folding, and they said, "What do we have that we could?" Use to keep our town alive. And someone said, well, the only thing that's ever happened here is the Beatles landed here for a few hours in 1964. But I want to tell you something. Of all the cities on the 1964 tour, 
every other city screamed and yelled and threw things and raged. And the mayor said, when the Beatles get here on Sunday morning, we are going to stand respectfully and we are not going to yell or scream. We are going to just stand there quietly when they walk to the plane. And I tell you what, that good karma came back. That bread they tossed upon the waters came back because the Beatles saved their town. Mm, That's just wonderful. All right. So before we go, I know we each uh, give our own contact information out to our listeners. We'll start with you, Alan. Okay. The easiest way to get to me is through Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix. Short and sweet with Alan. Mm -hmm. Uh, Steve? Mm -hmm. Um, you can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I also have a Beatles News and Information page on Facebook. Um, you can get a hold of the show at Things We Said Today uh, radio show at gmail.com. We have a Things We Said Today Beatles radio fans page on Facebook. There's also a second Things We Said Today page uh, for the weekend streamings by Fab4Radio.com. Thank you, Matt Burley. Uh, for that thank you also to michael lynch for the theme for the show and we have uh you can download the show at podbean.com or you can stream it uh at uh youtube where we also have a collection of a playlist of all our interviews which this one will be joining uh that group when we put the show up so uh, everything is there you can stream us and listen to us anytime you want 24 7 ken okay if any of you would like to catch my other beatles program every little thing you can always stream many of my archive shows at the website globaltexanchronicles.com there's well over 100 shows that i've done and most of them are there on the website So just click on the tab that says Ken Michaels, and you can hear it there. And also, while Steve mentioned that things we said today is heard on Fab Four Radio, so is every little thing. In fact, they're heard back-to-back on Sunday nights starting at 11 o'clock with every little thing. I also want to mention uh, my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net, and my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. I just want to mention that last week I had the the privilege – of interviewing Jack Douglas, which is going to be in my next Every Little Thing show. And the full interview is now on my website. And we talked about everything from how he started working with John as an engineer on the Imagine Sessions, his friendship with John through the years, also being co-producer on the Double Fantasy Sessions, what that was like. And I also did this interview, believe it or not, at Strawberry Fields. (laughs) And it was only maybe a couple hundred feet away from the Dakota, sitting on a bench with Lennon fans around, Beatle fans around. And it was a great thrill for me. And he does talk about the Imagine box set that's coming out, which um, is there in the interview. It's, I was hoping, we've been talking about this here on the show, that it would be coming out in October for his birthday. Um, but it looks like it's going to be early next year. But he talks about that in the interview. And um, just, he was... So warm and engaging, and you really felt like, you know, he's missing John so much. And being so close to the Dakota as we're doing this, it's like all the memories came flooding back and like it happened yesterday. But um, it was just a, an incredible interview, and I'm very proud to, to say that, um, that Jack Douglas spent time with me to talk about, you know, his friendship and work with John. And again, that's on my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. All right. So this has been a wonderful show. Again, thank you, Jude, for joining us. Thank you so much. What fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jude. And for Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen and Jude Kessler, this is Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.